Thank you very much, guys. So let's bring up Lily and Kwame up to the stage. Hello. Hello. Welcome, guys. So let's start off by, you know, obviously we've seen the video, but what is Impossible? Tell us a little bit about what it is, how people get involved, kind of what you're looking to do with it. Um, so it was based on uh, an idea that me and a friend of mine who's we're now working with us sitting in the audience had three years ago um, to use a technology platform to try and connect people to essentially do things for each other for free. We were talking about the fact that um, we were just talking about why is it that when economies paralyze that societies t uh, tend to paralyze behind them um, when intuitively everyone has time, skills, resources, um, things wouldn't there potentially be another way that we could connect people, that they could trade those? Um, I finished university, uh, the idea was still kind of stuck in me, and then in kind of barked on the last two year journey of trying to create that. And what was kind of, what was the spark though? So you talk about, it was three years ago, but what sparked it? Really like that idea, <laughs> um, like a very specific moment, um, it was like, it just seemed like a very simple idea and um, I couldn't understand why I wasn't seeing it happening at scale and then started looking at uh, looking at attempts happening to do that and not seeing any of them kind of growing at scale and um, and not seeing any that I personally felt like I could use or relate to and uh, and then also reading texts uh, in on the gift economy as a concept and how pre-capital societies have used it, how it's a big part of our society in kind of uh, unobvious ways and seeing the social value for it and so just feeling more and more inspired to try. And, well, let's, let's actually see. I would love to see how it actually works. Okay, so this is your user, like a user's profile, um, which is like, an, like in any social network, you can follow people and um, it shows wishes and thanks. Uh, which points to the two core functionalities of the app. So the first is um, wishing. If we go to the next slide. Which basically you can, this is a stream in the center, and you can post uh, things you wish for or things you can do. Um, hashtag logic is used to connect data. So in this instance, obviously, things like singing, for example, would be connected between those two ideas. And hopefully somebody who says they can teach singing starts to see the wishes of people who've said they would love to learn how to sing. Um, you can filter it according to location, so to see stuff that's near you, and um, by following too, so to see your friends' your friends' wishes. And then, okay, so this this is an example of somebody's being fulfilled. So there's a wish um, to try and get. Uh, it was actually air miles they needed to for this girl um, uh, with a disease who wanted to go to this symposium in Japan. Um, an astronaut had posted it. The guy re responded saying that he would donate his air miles. Um, hopefully one day in the future can meet the astronaut. And then uh, at the end of the dialogue, uh, because he donated it, the astronaut said thank you. And then thank you is a kind of, uh, kind of slightly like subversion of the idea of a currency by making an abundant currency that um, you can't, like it's kind of valueless, but sits on people's profiles and reflects what they've been doing in the system. And that's a real astronaut, by the way. That's yeah, the, uh, and that's really his picture from space. <laughs> And that's just some a mixture of content from the from from the app. And I should also say, in the last um, two years, I met uh, Kwame, who's sitting next to me a year ago, and he's the kind of CTO of the project and the reason that we could actually build it and make it happen. Uh, my title has changed from right hand man to CTO. To you can uh, have whatever yeah. he wants. <laughs> <laughs> so is this? I mean, in terms of the software behind it, is it based on anything? Did you guys create everything from the ground up? Uh, we created everything from the ground up. Uh, we had to, we did follow, I mean, it's not, it has been a joint effort uh, by loads of people. Um, you know, Edward in, in, in San Francisco, um, loads of people in, in Lisbon, uh, developing out of Lisbon, um, out of the, the office over here. So it's been, it's been really a joint, it's, it's the product of, of gifting. Um, and that's, I think, what's beautiful about this project, that it came about as a gift. I, I met Lily, I liked the, um, I loved the idea, and I said, we'll gift, we'll, we'll, we'll do it for free. Um, we'll gift our time, um, and hopefully learn something along the way. Um, and 
and that's how it came to be. And other, loads of other people have gifted time. Uh, and it's the only reason why we're here right now. Is because it, it's, as a culture of giving, um, it, does, it is what it says, right? It is, it's it's right. there because of giving. And talk to me about the logistics of it, really. So can anyone just kind of go on Impossible, create an account, and start posting wishes? Pretty much anyone, yeah. Uh, you have to be over 18. We're trying to lower that uh, barrier slightly. Um, right now, we've been getting a lot of feedback from everyone. Um, you know, the profile, everyone's saying we need richer profiles, otherwise it's harder to give. Um, and we're, react we're listening, we really are listening, and we are reacting in real time to what you are saying, and we're evolving the, the app. Um, we're evolving the app, so in a dialogue, in a multi-log with, with everyone out there. I think that's what's, what's relevant right now. And right now, is it really is it just an app? Is it is it web based? Is uh, it uh, it's an app. It's an iOS app. Uh, it's web based. We have a website. The website is is catching up. Right. Um, it is catching up pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, as the more users we get, the faster we can actually accelerate in the right direction because this is not done for our egos. It's done for for you. Um, so, so yeah, we, we will release an Android app. We're going to have like a Hawaiian hackathon right. uh, and uh, everyone in bikinis and we'll do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. So, can in terms of wishing, right, do you moderate it? Because, you know, on the one hand, what's keeping me from going on there and be like, I wish J.J. Abrams puts me in the new Star Wars movie. How does that work? You can say that. Can I? <laughs> okay, I'm, that's exactly what I'm going to say. I don't I'm know if say. we can, can make it happen, but you can say it. We never know. Well, it is called impossible, right? <laughs> never Let's know. Um, we try and discourage uh, violent, uh, monetary, and sexual content. And the um, way we've built it is that you can flag, flag content. So we're trying to structure it in as, as much as possible in the most decentralized way. So trying to put in tools into the app that will allow the community to moderate itself. Um, we blacklist, I mean, certain words that would be, um, you know, like pretty offensive, I think, to be on it. Um, but for the most part, uh, uh, philosophically, the emphasis for me is trying to create the tools whereby the users can define what it needs to be and can self-manage and self-moderate so that we can stay quite uh, light touch and small as an entity. So is there no physical moderator then? Alex is moderating. Al yeah, Alex is. We have one physical moderator. Right. Uh, and I, I have no idea how much she has to leave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we do we do have a, a, a list of, of terms that right. we kind of bar. Uh, it's working well so far. If I think we need to, uh, there will be the exception to the rule, and then we'll start to react to that. But uh, so far, so good. Yeah, it's as I said from a philosophical perspective. I really don't want us to f become like this omnipotent governing entity deciding what should it should not be in the app. Um, I think there's a baseline of like kind of what the point of the exercise is and then trying to enable the users to generate the environment. Well, that's really interesting, but what if it becomes something that you guys kind of don't want it to become? Because, and I mean that if it's self-moderator, I'm kind of thinking of like if you I take- I think there's a balance probably, you mm. know. Well, I was thinking of Craigslist, for, for example, right? So, like, on Craigslist, you can't get on Craigslist now and not see kind of recruiters on there, people selling property. And, you know, I completely take your point of not wanting to have it monetized. I said there's a baseline. So, I do think there's a... I mean, um, the whole... If it becomes, like, if, for example, the reason I'm not letting kind of or wanting monetary things to be on there is mm -hmm. because I feel like there's already a billion platforms that allow that. Right. Um, and the point of this is to create a space where that isn't the medium and that isn't the point. Um, so, yeah, I feel like there's a couple of those. And I obviously not, not putting violent content. I don't think there's anybody who could give me a, a strong, compelling argument for why we should <laughs> like <laughs> let that. Um, so I think there's a couple of things that are quite clear. And then uh, how it moves in and within that space is unclear. Okay. So, you know, you, you, in your interviews, you guys talk about how you structure this. Because this, this is not a charity, correct? No. What is it? Uh, it is a Eunice social business, to be specific. Um, so, I, the beginning of last year, before I'd met Kwame, actually, um, I went to Davos, the World Economic Forum, and um, 
over the course of that, you know, the, the, the course of the year is conceptualizing different problems to solve in, in, in thinking about how to design this. And at that moment in time, I was thinking a lot about the business structure of it and um, a potential paradox that could be created between wanting to create a gift economy and all the reasons I could talk about why I see value in trying to encourage a gift economy and then inevitably having to structure that within a monetary economy because, you know, I was personally paying people at the time in inevitably in future it would cost money to have people full-time running it and um, if it was successful it has the potential to make money too um, so when I went to Davos I met Jimmy Wales for the first time founder of Wikipedia and the first thing I asked him was why did you make Wikipedia a non-profit because I was very curious to uh, to see what his like if he thought about any other vehicles at that time and had a good conversation with him about that. And not long after, as I said to somebody, you know, my instinct in it is that I would really ideally love to make it a business because um, essentially money is power nowadays. And if it could generate a lot of revenue that we could potentially try and do good per se with, that would be amazing. Um, and potentially more powerful, it would seem, than a, than a charity. Um, and then delegate that profit you know, into a social mission of sorts. And the person I was with said, oh, you should look at um, Professor Eunice's business structure, Eunice Social Business, um, who I coincidentally had met that day. And so I started studying his model um, and I went to Bangladesh with him that summer. And um, this was around the time I actually met Kwame. And so we'd met once and then I went to Bangladesh, studied that model, um, felt very compelled by it, came back and said, oh, I, I don't know how you feel about this, but I was thinking about making it um, a unisocial business, which essentially means as an investor, you won't make any money. <laughs> um, the way unisocial business is structured is um, you run a business with a social mission and then um, you generate profit. And then 100% of that profit goes into kind of the social mission per se. Um, investors receive their initial investment back. Um, and they're in, it's kind of, I guess... I guess it's philanthropic investment, but rather than putting money into charity that you don't ever see a re uh, financial return on, you are able to take your money back, reinvest it again, and um, hopefully structure enterprises that solve problems. But it's it's still a business, right? It's a business that needs to be profitable, and the more profitable it is, the more good we can actually do, right? So I think that's the main difference is that no one is skimming from the top. We don't think of profit. Uh, we actually think of you know, the positive, the positive consequence of what, where that money is going. We're not thinking of dividends. Um, and everything gets reinvested and we can actually do more. So that's, that's, that's the idea behind the social business. So, Which is obviously all hypothetical at this stage where we don't have any profit. <laughs> right. So, that, so <laughs> let's, let's drill on that for a little bit, actually. <laughs> What's the kind of in the future? How, are you, how do you plan to make money off of this? Granted, I take it that you want to reinvest the money, and we'll talk about that in a second, but how are you going to monetize this? Um, we've been exploring a few different ideas. Um, the one kind of integral to Impossible itself is uh, probably going to be based on an, a membership that would be optional and would have certain um, kind of uh, certain benefits to it. Um, not benefits within the community, but just benefits to that user. Um, and then we're exploring now of structuring a separate company that um, would also be a social business um, that would be in a monetary context, but would, um, uh, I have a kind of history through fashion of looking at um, money, and, and Kwame actually has a history of this with his own businesses, um, of looking at monetary uh, production lines and how if you try and drive transparency, look at cleaning up supply chains, um, you can have a much, like, you know, potentially a positive social environmental effect. So an obvious example is the body shop who I work with who have an amazing kind of corporate um, social responsibility. And so we potentially are looking at creating a platform that um, will draw attention to affiliate companies who have really uh, great production lines, basically. So right now you can gift um, using a picture and it's free and it will always be free. But we're looking at this new environment where you can gift products um, that we don't really think is products, but we, see, we think as stories. So where they come from, um, who built them, who create them, um, and what ingredients go into the mix, what's their impact uh, in this planet. So it's those stories that we would like people to gift. And obviously they need to use the great British pound or the Bitcoin or the, uh, the, the US dollar to purchase those. So, okay, so that's kind of the business side of social business. Correct. Where's, can you talk a little bit more about the social aspect? 
I think in lots of ways. I mean, one, the macro structure of the company will still be a unisocial business. So any profit we make in the macro will just go into supporting Impossible, growing the company, etc. Um, uh, maybe doing funding new great things in future if we ever make that much. Um, but then that aside, um, I think it's really important. There are loads of small companies trying to... I have, for example, a knitwear company where we name the knitters and we try and create a really ethical, transparent production chain. And it's a really hard business. My friend runs it and it's a really hard business to try and do. Um, and I know there are many, many small businesses trying to do the right thing. And... Um, one, I think it's hard for those companies to, to have like attention drawn to them. And I also think it's potentially difficult for consumers who want to make conscientious choices with their purchases to, to be able to differentiate, differentiate um, what the impact is of the different companies you might, um, you might have a dialogue with. And so trying to work in that space and um, shine a light on companies that are doing good things and try and draw an audience to them, I think hopefully would have a positive effect outside of ourselves. You guys talk about impact. Now, this may be very early days, but I'd love to kind of just talk about how you plan to measure social impact. Um, or is that, you know, are, it, are, are we not there just yet? I think we're looking at metrics still mm -hmm. for how that can be measured. Uh, we're, we're, we have a little, um, a little studio on Barrick Street, which we're opening this 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 Thursday, I think, uh, to tr start fulfilling wishes. So we're looking at the wish landscape um, and, and we're, we're learning and we're reacting to that. And we're saying, okay, how can, we, how can we start matching some of those? How can we help fulfill as many as we can uh, or at least empower people to do so by connecting them with the right people? Um, so the, the metrics is still very early days because it's you know all these wishes are coming in and we're reacting to those and they're they're different and some are very different from what we were expecting and so we're like okay how uh, you know what yeah you know, i could give you the number of wishes mm -hmm. but it's not really about the number uh, it's about the quality and and how they get fulfilled and that's a really interesting point because the quality of kind of the wishes right because going back to my star wars example so funny, the quality <laughs> of the wish. <laughs> no, 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 but, but it's, it's, I don't mean from the point of view, obviously everybody can get on there and put something what, that they wish and what they want, but could, could an argu be, argument be made that some wishes would have more of a tangible social impact than others? Again, my Star Wars example, it'd be awesome for me and awesome for you guys to see me as a Jedi, but beyond that, really, like... No, ultimately, we want, we, we're trying to foster a community, yeah. uh, uh, right? So if, if it, if... So if those wishes, by quality, I mean those are the wishes that you can connect with new people, that you can learn from, that you connect with your neighborhood in in novel ways. And I think I think that's that, that's why I mentioned quality. It, you know, just asking for money that's a wish, right. but it doesn't you know it doesn't really register in our radar. Now wishes that allow people to connect. You know, I'm going to teach somebody to cook. I'll improvise. Um, the, this this uh, this Thursday. Um, and she's in the neighborhood, and I've never met her, and she doesn't know how to cook. And I, you know, I wanted to be a cook when I was uh, a young boy. So um, perhaps something will come out of that, right? Yeah, and I think it's worth really pointing out that it's not about. Um, there are a couple of wishes, like the example I showed there, the of uh, the astronaut, where potentially somebody could wish something uh, social or big or outside themselves. I wished for a Greenpeace uh, campaign to be uh, people to sign the petition. And people did, um, but really the. The value for me, well, I, I feel like the value is not, the reason I'm doing it is not for that so much as it is for the very small personal connections that we can drive and make and the arguments around why, um, you know, when I was we're reading books on the gift economy and this idea that when somebody does something for someone else um, without an expectation of return, a subtle relationship is created between those two individuals. Um, and then that engenders often reciprocity and so on mass you start to create social cohesion and so for me the real value comes in a very like subtle hopefully in a very subtle small way between lots of individuals doing lots of small things um as opposed to kind of like big grandiose ideas if that makes sense no, that makes sense and how do you respond to kind of like you know if, if i was critical of the idea and saying well actually guys this is kind of a pipe dream this is impossible you'd be better off just raising a whole bunch of money and then giving it to charity that's why we call it impossible yeah <laughs> that doesn't answer my question <laughs> and that's why we crossed the IMA. <laughs> uh, but we're doing it right 
Mm. It's it's happening. I've I've met a neighbor already because of that. I uh, met so many people <laughs> even trying to do it for the last two years. Yeah. I've made so many friends. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's working for me. It, it it is working. Yeah. And you're gonna teach somebody how to cook. <laughs> I'll I'll do my best. There. <laughs> Partnerships. I want to talk about kind of you know you talk you you talk a lot about the individual and an individual getting on the platform and making a wish. But in many ways, you know, I kind of see an organization like HUK. HUK can get on there and say, I wish to have, okay, we wish to have 25 volunteers come and spend Christmas Eve with a lonely elderly person. How, you know, have you guys thought about how you could partner with, how, one, how organizations are going to use the platform or can they use the platform? And two, you know, reaching out to charities and really kind of having very strategic partnerships like that. Um, right now, uh, I've got a few thoughts on this. Right now, it's only open to individuals, so it's very peer-to-peer. And um, I think, hopefully, if we grow an audience in future, I think it could become a really great resource for, for charities to use. Um, the reason I didn't want to jump into that initially was because I feel like so much of the things we do for free or voluntary work is understood in that sector. Um, and the hope here is to try and make that more normative and peer-to-peer. And um, I think if it... If we, if that became the bias, you know, when you came to the site that it was a platform for lots of charities to post wishes, then you would kind of miss the point that it's trying to make in a way. Um, but I do think in time it would be potentially a really, I'd love to, I mean, if we get to the point where we have enough users that we can really then provide value into those entities, mm-hmm. it'd be a wonderful moment. Um, yeah, that was my main thought. <laughs> Anything to add? Uh, not really, no. no. Oh, I had one other thought. Yeah. And that was that... Um, Separate partnerships, separate to charities. There are loads of platforms nowadays doing uh, similar but different things. So there's, I mean, just in the last year, there's been the Le Web, which is this big tech conference that happens in June. I was dedicated to digital hippies and the sharing economy this summer. Um, there are lots of platforms coming up that do what we're trying to do, but in more niche potentially ways um, or in a different kind of structure. And um, I would really love to try and build partnerships with those um, with those platforms because the hope is you know we've is to tr- if we're trying to create a more cooperative economy I would hate to compete <laughs> in the macro so um, I hope that we can create partnerships with uh, other tech companies doing similar things basically you should wish for that okay hey, I'll post it hey. tonight that's my wish <laughs> a couple of questions before we turn it over to the audience um, the Guardian social enterprise network has over the last couple of weeks, asked people kind of what the social business, what the social enterprise mean to them. And I'd love to kind of pose that to both of you. Just what the social business, what the social enterprise mean to you? Uh, I, yeah, I can go first. Uh, to me, um, I, I, um, I run a, a, a large global innovation agency and when after having uh, met Lily and gone through some books that she recommended, kind of, um, I, I changed the I changed the model by which we work. Uh, so we we're now a social enterprise in the sense that the people that are working with me are not working for me. We all lead wonderful lifestyles. We have jobs, which is great, you know, which is a luxury, um, and and everything. All the profit gets reinvest, reinvested into our own crazy projects and crazy ideas. Uh, and so for me, a social enterprise is, so, is a structure that, uh, that enables collectives to really maximize their potential um, rather than work for a hierarchy, work for owners, work for a structure. They're, they're working ultimately for themselves. So it's, it's closer to... To my idea of you know corporate freedom, if you can call it that, Lily, um, I kind of fell into it through fashion um, because I was working simultaneously for different uh, companies I was advertising for, and then also for different charities, looking at obviously big global problems, and. Um, a uh, charity I work, I'm a patron of now called the Environmental Justice Foundation drew my attention to cotton, um, like cotton trading. And through that experience and through several others, I started to go, hey, like so many of the things I buy cause so many problems in their production chains. It seems really like, um, it seems like I'm never, there's never going to be a systemic change if we keep creating problems in the one hand and then solving them in a separate hand as opposed to trying to get those hands to meet together. And... Um, 
and solve problems through business itself. And so um, I've explored that in different ways. Um, this entity does it in a, quite a different extreme way to the things I've been doing before. But in all instances, it's like uh, my focus is on looking at systemic long-term ways of addressing problems. And I think that uh, business as a landscape right now is a, you know, is a very powerful way to do that. So last question, what do you guys wish for? Um, I, what do I wish for? Um, I wish for other, so for the social network landscape that we see out there and loads of social networks and to, to start looking at these type of exa these type of examples, impossible being, being one and, and a, a very relevant one and, and, and looking at it from the perspective of not, not empowering people to, to cannibalize each other, to kind of consume each other, but to actually give to each other. And that's, that's why we have the thank you and not the like. The like is like, okay, I saw it, I liked it, I consumed it. We have the thank you, which is much, much more subtle, much more, I actually, you did, you did something for me, that's so nice, so I'm going to give you a thank you. Um, and I, these, are, these are very simple ideas, very hard to get to, all the merit to the lady to my left, um, that, that I would like other digital structures to start, um, to start employing uh, for, for, for users uh, so that we can start to see major change. Lily? I don't know. That's a really hard question. <laughs> um, right today, I wish for a few days off, to be honest. <laughs> um, I, um, for me, it's, I don't know, I kind of just... It comes from like a place of like a value systems and a cultural thing. And I would just really wish for, and it sounds so cheesy, but just like happiness for like, for us to start to just me to recognize what makes me happy and others to start to rec recognize what makes them happy and really moves the society towards that. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So we're gonna turn it over to some questions. Um, just so you know, there is, um, we have a hashtag going of impossible guardian. All, it's a hashtag, so it's all one word, Impossible Guardian. So um, if anybody has a question, you can submit it on Twitter. When introducing a new social-based idea like Impossible, is it more important to create awareness or enthusiasm? I think, um, I would think, if it was like sustained and genuine, enthusiasm. Um, because I imagine awareness comes, um, I, you know, things grow if they want to grow because people want them to live um, we can do all the awareness raising in the world if we want to, but if people are enthusiastic about it, then I'd imagine if, you, if you're excited about something, you'll advocate it, you'll talk about it, and then awareness comes from that. That's just natural. The audience. How about this gentleman right here? Uh, this is a bit more practical question in terms of the, fun the functionality of the app. So there are certain kinds of networks that try to facilitate this kind of giving between people maybe in a different way so couch surfing for instance is a website that facilitates people is staying with local people when they're traveling uh, for free uh, but an important thing in that like you were talking about wishing for somebody to to teach you to cook how do you know that you can trust the person that poses uh, the wish so at couch surfing for instance like you have this reference system where people that have stayed with other people leave them references so you can kind of see what experiences other people have had with with uh, with, with staying with them how are we, are we going to do some of the same thing for impossible are you going to see who other people have thanked them and what they've done and so forth um the thank yous are always public and that I feel is quite important actually to the platform for that reason. Um, and um, so you can go through a user's profile and see their history through that. And then we're actually in the process of adding more verification and making uh, profiles fuller. Um, so it will become, you'll get more and more of a sense of the other user. So the first simple verification will be an email. And then, um, you know, you, you can enter your credit card and you know, we'll know it's you. How many Facebook friends? It's hard to fake sometimes your Gmail. So those tiers will start adding adding granularity to the uh, to the profile, um, and that will hopefully instill s more trust in into the system. And it will never be verifying this person's good or bad. It will just be verifying that, that we know who this person is, basically. Yeah. So it becomes non-anonymous. And then, um, as I said, the public thanks is a more kind of uh, human abstract way of getting a sense of another. And potentially, if people put on links to their online profiles, you can get a sense of the other person. And mutual friends um, 
trying to create an environment that can make it more transparent and more accountable, but without, again, making it like right or wrong. And it's integrated with Facebook and Twitter. And, and Instagram. Instagram. And Instagram, okay. Speaking of social media, any more questions from kind of the, from Twitter? Yeah. What were the first steps you took when setting up Impossible? Talking to people. Um, the, uh, actually, the first thing I did was hire a developer, <laughs> which was a really bad idea before I'd worked out what I wanted to build <laughs> or anything. Um, and then I started talking to people. Um, uh, I spoke first to a man called Brian Boylan, who works in a uh, branding company, and I just met him coincidentally at a party. We'd gotten along. Um, at the end of the day, he told me his job, and I was like, oh, that sounds like something that could help me with this crazy idea I have. Um, and I kind of just kept approaching it in that way. I, if I ever I met somebody um, and started chatting to them about the idea and they loved it, uh, I somehow ev evolved into having a little ship of people around me who were helping me trying to work out how to turn it into a reality. Which is, before I turn it on, I'm going to sneak in another question. In, I mean, that, that's a great piece of advice for a budding social entrepreneur, for somebody who you know, has an idea. Kind of, you know, if you had one great piece of advice for someone, given your own experiences, what would that be? To be collaborative. Um, the, uh, the, the, as Kwame said at the beginning, this only aim, kind of came into existence through a very, very collaborative process on many levels. Um, and so I think being open to, you know, to, to kind of cra creating a group around you of people who, for whatever reason, believe in what you're trying to do um, and work together to try and achieve it will make it much more possible than um, doing it alone, depending on what it is. But I think in most instances. Uh, uh, come again, what was the question? <laughs> what's the, what's that one piece of advice to, to kind of like... To a young entrepreneur to, trying I, to make I, it... I think Lily did very well uh, <laughs> by talking to each other, and, uh, uh, to each other, by talking to loads of different people. Um, and I, I think this, this, if you look at startups and, you know, you have loads of different environments where they incubate and gestate and they have all these weird biological terms, um, it really is all about putting people together. Uh, you know, education, as somebody at the MIT once said, is about meeting interesting people. So, um, and that's also the, the best way to validate your ideas. Because before you start building anything, you need to validate your ideas. You need to feel like you are going to add value to people's lives. And that you can only do um, conversing uh, through social intercourse, not through, uh, you know, uh, bedroom uh, fantasies. So, so kind of be collaborative and talk to as many people as possible. And I think That's also it. be open with it. I was so like, the beginning, I was like, didn't want to, I was like so scared to talk to you about this idea because I don't know, it's weird, like possessive mentality. And then I just let that go and start just whatever, just telling everyone. <laughs> and that made it actually move. Right. All right. A couple more questions. Sure, right here. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering how the app works with regards to the, the like the sort of, local side of things, so vicinity, how it works in the sense that it could be international or is it more sort of local? How, do, how does that aspect work? Good question. So um, when you post a kind of what a wish or what you can do, there's only one question at the end, which is, is location relevant? Um, so like, does this happen, need to happen in the real world? Um, if you say no, then it, the kind of the system doesn't take location into account and say for example I said I can teach English and I could teach it online so I don't need doesn't location doesn't matter that would be shown potentially to anybody around the world who's wished for English lessons um, versus if I say I could teach yoga and I say location is relevant because I want to teach in the real world um, it will be shown to people who are close to me and use a kind of proximity filtering mechanism to do that is it only in English right now uh, yes. Uh, only in English right now, but we're we're working hard to uh, to start uh, localizing it. I think it's I think it's very important uh, to have different languages. We actually have people in different countries using it in different languages, like yeah. they're posting wishes in Portuguese or Spanish or whatever. But um, but yeah, the main architecture is in English. Right. Okay. Another question. Right there, sir. Hi. I was just curious um, if you've. Um, because it, it's, it sounds very much like a sort of ideal sense of how we think of community um, in an old-fashioned sense. And I was just wondering if you've 
if it's been up enough for you to know if it's working particularly in smaller communities or in big anonymous cities or if, if there's a particular um, section of people that you feel is more difficult to reach. Uh, I can have that one. Uh, we've, I mean, we've been going for what, a month. We, we haven't been going for long enough. Uh, so I, I wish I could answer that with real accurate data. And I want to be, I think we want to be in a position where we can really answer that question. But at the moment, it's, you know, I, like I said, for, from a personal experience, I've met a neighbor. Um, it has worked for me in Soho. It has worked for me in Lisbon. Uh, I was in Argentina, didn't really work for me. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I think we're still, I think it's still early days. But you, I mean, just to kind of piggyback on that question, you do get a, a real sense that this is about kind of, at, in, in its most basic level, where we're kind of reaching out and talking to people, as, as you said, in a way that maybe we've lost a little bit. I mean, when I was prepping for this interview, I kind of read, I read in an interview with you that you said that, you know, in London, most people only know one neighbor which is kind of true in a way, right? So it's, 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 it, there's, there's a nice, even though all of this is tech-based, there's a real nice kind of physical, tangible, you know, connections yeah. that are going to be made. And I grew up in London, and then, as um, Kwame just said, we don't have enough data to see how it's going to work or, like, where it will work most effectively. But my assumption would be that it will be of potentially most value in cities um, because I, the impression I get is that this behavior, and I've seen this behavior happening without an app needing to encourage it in smaller communities around the world, actually in a lot of developing world uh, countries as well. Um, and I think it's my experience of big cities having lived in New York and having lived here where um, it feels really... Uh, it feels really rare to connect and uh, to know the people who are living around you, working around you, even that you walk past in the streets day to day. Um, and so potentially I imagine it's in dense cities that it might add more value trying to make very complex social uh, situations a little bit more uh, manageable. All right, two more quick questions. Right here. Hi, thanks for uh, talking to us, guys. Um, I've got like a kind of two-part question, if you don't mind. Um, the first part is basically, uh, I remember Lily, uh, when you spoke at uh, Future Fest, you mentioned about the green sort of um, data centers that you guys use. I think it was um, in Iceland or somewhere. So just wondering, because uh, obviously you are very kind of conscious about the physicality or sort of the ecology of, um, of that footprint kind of thing. Um, have you thought about the um, user information and that kind of privacy, that, that side of things, obviously with the NSA and all that kind of stuff, and all the integration that you guys have from Google to Facebook and all these different um, sort of companies? Is it something that you take into consideration? Because obviously the value moving forward isn't, in the future, isn't really particularly going to be sort of uh, physical. It's going to be the information that we kind of have, you know, the, inf the information that sort of Google uses to sort of, you know, get AdWords and Facebook and so on, because um, obviously that's pretty valuable. So I'm just wondering what, uh, whether you've been thinking about that and whether you've kind of approached that. So I suppose that's kind of um, the first part. Um, Should we answer that and then yeah, go to the second part? I'm going to forget that. The moment that, you otherwise. bring the NSA into it, <laughs> it, requ it requires some thought. Let's, let's answer that part first. I okay, have, cool, I'm sure thanks. you'll have an opinion on this too. I've thought about this a lot. Um, uh, so the company he's referencing, just so you know, is called Green Cloud, and that's where we do our hosting. It's in Iceland um, because uh, little known fact that the Internet creates as much carbon now, I think maybe more than aviation. Um, so we use a carbon neutral company that uses geothermal energy. Um, on the point of data, um, I don't think we've necessarily answered it yet, but one of the reasons we're also attracted to Iceland is because they have really good data protection laws, apparently through the government. Um, I did a talk with Tim Berners-Lee and Jimmy Wales last Friday when Tim Berners-Lee announced the Web Index, the new Web Index where they uh, basically measure the impact of the web um, globally for the last year. And uh, the use of data and surveillance has made the UK and the US drop down in that Web Index for over the last uh, year by several points. Um, I'm not saying that we've solved, like we're solving those issues, but it's definitely something we're mindful of. Um, also, from a business perspective, we're not looking at at people, uh, at, at users' data as a commodity, uh, and w we always veered away from that. And I don't think we will in the future. Um, so we're looking at alternative business models where we don't have to, where you're not the commodity, right? Like you offer Google and. 
yes. and companies like that. Yeah, that's why when we talked about business models just before, we didn't say anything about advertising or selling data, basically, because that's not the that's not the plan. Um, and I don't. I've actually asked our lawyers if legally we can make uh, make it such that users own their own data, even though we're storing it. And that's something we're just work, trying to work it through legally. Well, let us know. I mean, a lot of people in the audience will find that really interesting. So I think we'd appreciate, you know, when you kind of figure out how to do that, let us know. I will think that would be really interesting. Um, I'm going to, we only have time for one more question, so I'm going to give the opportunity if that's okay. Um, yes, sir. Um, so you, you obviously have the thank yous. Is there an anti-thank you if someone did something <laughs> poorly? I mean, you can write whatever you want on your thank you. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, cool. Thanks. That goes into the backlog. We will. Uh, no, all right, no, no, no. It's already there. They can just use it however they want. <laughs> well, that was a very short question. All right, one more. Anyone? All right, right here, sir. Um, so, with the anonymity of people in London and nobody really knowing anybody, um, aside from the technology and the platform itself, what do you see being the biggest challenge um, as you guys launch? Cultural? I don't know. I think it's quite. Um, don't say there's any vanity at all, but there's a reason why it's called impossible. Like it's quite an ambitious thing to try and do, and I'm aware of that, and that's something that we deal with daily in trying to work out how the technology and the tool can be improved. Um, and it's a constant process, and it will hopefully get better and better all the time. Um, but I do think there's a cultural potential barrier to making something that uh, is not always normal feel more normative. So kind of to wrap things up then, success. How do you define success with this thing? Um, every time I heard today, like, I got so excited for about, I just caught myself for about 10 seconds because I heard about somebody using it and meeting somebody and, like, there was, like, real tangible action, you know? Um, if that happens, like, if that continues to happen and people are deriving real, very small-scale value from it, um, that, to me, is, I'll feel, like, happy and glad I did this journey. I, I have a cooking lesson to give, so for me that is <laughs> success enough. Exactly, exactly. If I'm in Star Wars, then that's real success. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you very, very much. I want to thank the Apple team. You guys have been brilliant. Obviously, thank let's you. give these guys a round of applause, please. Thank you.